Hello, hello, hello. Hi, so you can hear me. Hello. Yeah, I can. Sorry, I was muted and I was on okay. another screen. Okay. I also Hi. had my I didn't realize I had my uh, what's it called now? My earplugs plugged into the computer, but was not oh. fixed to my ears, so I couldn't okay. even hear if you were speaking. Okay. Okay. So how's it been? How's your weekend going? Busy, but all right. <laughs> hey, what part of the US are you? I mean, Chicago. Okay. Okay. It's not like yeah. I know the geography anyway. I'm in um, I'm in Oshawa in Ontario. What am I asking you? You wrote it in your bio. Pardon me. You put your bio, didn't you? <laughs> okay, maybe I, I think did. It did. I don't know I why I you in America again. That I am in Canada. In Canada, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Oh, I like your sweater. Oh, thank you. Yeah. This sounds so faint. I don't know if. Let me can see. You hear me? I can hear you clearly. Yes. Okay, but you kind of sound faint. Maybe it's from my end. It's definitely from my end because I can hear you clearly. Okay, now I can't hear you. No, I can see your lips moving, but I can't hear you. You are muted. You are muted. Okay, I think I'm gonna to have to do without this. Okay. Hope. Because the moment I plugged it in, then that was when the microphone went off. Went off, okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what's your yeah, yeah, it's okay. I just I, I didn't want to be the one no. uh, coming on late. So, so even if you come like 10 minutes, you'll still be fine because we'll like do an introduction and all that. So be fine. And then sometimes when people don't show up on time, we'll give them some time to join so that, you know, like they don't miss as much. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, anyway, I mean, I, I'm just hoping like uh, we're able to cover um, a lot of grounds today. Yeah, especially yeah. on business plan because, like I said, the business plan encompasses yeah, a lot. Yeah, yeah, it's not a one off session, so having to cram so much into a single hour. Yeah, you, yeah, you say you wanted to come back, so I'm thinking maybe in like three weeks or four weeks. If you have, okay, free. yeah, we'll work around that. Yeah, and join the um, Canada people, and we'll do the second session as well. Okay. Are they joining this one? Yeah, I should hope so. Yeah. <laughs> let me let me tag that. No, 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 no. Okay. No. So when you said we'll join Canada people. But what I meant is that I told them that you know the way we already started they said they maybe yeah. they can do AB yeah. Canada. Yeah. But we'll make it clear that is a continuation of this one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I get what you mean. It's a continuation of the workshop. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So that kind of thing. Yeah. So that's yeah. So one interesting thing happened yesterday, what? Um, last night. Um, while I was working, then I don't know what website I went to. Mm -hmm. I think my account was going to be hacked into. Oh, no. I had to call the IT people and I had to reset my password and I forgot about it. And I went back to my laptop in the evening and I couldn't I could access, access it. it. Oh, your work. I couldn't access it. Are you serious? Yeah, oh, so you nice you're still not. No, I had, I mean, like, I had to, like, um, start over again. I had to oh, no. uh, work on present. Well, just come up with something for the presentation. Then the template, you know, I said I had tweaked it. Yes. So I had to redo it. Oh, that's yeah, it. Thank you. Yeah. God will bless you for your effort. <laughs> yeah, so that's why right when you were chatting with me. My mind was not even there. I was like, yeah, let me even yeah. start this thing. Let me even start this thing off first. I can't time. imagine. Man. Yeah. Yeah, but thank God it's done. God yes. is in control. Where is the group? I want to say, um, there are so many groups I get confused. TCM business leaders. Okay. <sighs> That's all I do. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Today is uh, Saturday. If it was Lagos now, would have said everybody has gone for one. I've gone for one bit. That's it. Oh, oh. oh, I can't tell her. Um, Marianne is, is on your group, right? Yes. She's your assistant. Yes. Okay, thank you. Well, she's not really my assistant. She's um she's learning so that she can take over her own <laughs> next semester. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. 
But you don't have another assistant? No. Oh, so she's your assistant. She's shadowing you. Yeah. So what do you do? I'm a stay at home mom. Pardon me? I'm a stay at home mom. Okay, and, um, and I cater, I cater, I actually cater, but not on a large scale, so that's it. Okay, and so you are you are a startup business owner, then. yeah, yeah. I'm looking for <laughs> better ways of doing what I do, and um, okay, I mean, I don't want to be cooking forever, like, I would like to see something along those lines, but something more okay, something that can be more automated is what I would say, okay. Yeah. So you should join our business automation um, workshop next week, Friday. Did yeah. I tell about it already? No. Oh, okay, so we have a business automation, automating your business process, and we have um, an expert who will be speaking with us next week, Friday. Okay, okay. Maybe I will just share that information with you if you want to join. And if there's Maybe, any you can send you know. because the truth of the matter is that you don't even know what will minister to you, what exactly they're doing. Yeah. So yeah, we'll share it in the group. Yeah. Okay, I think I mentioned it in that our group, that um, that our mutual group. Okay, okay. And I will share. I will share when when we have the flyers ready. I will. I will share. Okay, I think we have a few people. Yeah, Aki and Adela, welcome. Hello, hello. There's Aki and there's Tolu. There's um, Adela. Oh, I didn't see Tolu. And Titi. Hello, hello, hello. Good evening, all. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. How's the weekend going? Um, I'm on my bed. You're on your bed. Oh, do I envy you? I am on a different time zone. Time so zone. Oh, where are you? I'm in London. Okay. Oh, wow. So it's really late for you. Wow. Thanks for making I, the effort to be here. I know. I know God has something to stop Thank you. Thank you. Thank, so, you. Amen. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, Adrian. Okay. So we have more people coming from the Owa and Bay joining us. Abby. Pastor Wally, welcome. Good evening, Mass and Sass. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Good evening everybody. Good evening. Welcome. Good evening, sir. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening, Maria. Yeah, good evening. Okay, so just uh, let me know when it's time to start. I think we have a decent number of people. Since it's long, we'll start pretty soon. Okay, let's start with the prayer. So we'll, um, Papa Wale, can you please start us off with an opening prayer? Father, we thank you once again for today. We give you all the glory. We give you all the praise. Thank you for bringing us together. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the vision for this community group. Thank you even for last week's session. Thank you for today's session. Thank you for opening the eyes of our understanding. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, that your Holy Spirit will take preeminence over everything we'll be talking about. Take all the glory. We commit our speaker into your hands, Lord. She will speak as your oracle. Let eyes be open and let your name be glorified at the end of the day. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Yeah, amen. Thank you, Pastor Wally. Pleasure. Thank you. So, um, everybody, something happened on my computer. Okay, so, um, good evening, everyone. Welcome. So, um, today's um, session, we're going to be um, working on a business plan. So, I mean, we all already know that a great business plan leads to success, and that's when it's well executed and you know, thoughtfully planned out. It's a very good um, first step for an entrepreneur. So that is why um, we feel like this is something that been um, important for a group such as the Aspiring Business Owners um, Group. So um, obviously our businesses are different, they're different in value, they're going to differ um, in marketing, in the operations, whatever our financial objectives are, but the good planning will increase the odds of success for us. So, um, We've invited our guest speaker to come and teach us um, how to write a business plan. The business plan encompasses a lot of things. I mean, you have to establish information for the business plan, create the environment, establish performa, identify risk, develop expected flash flow, you know, so you have a lot of things that are encompassed in the business plan. So I'm just saying this, what I've listed is not even all of it, it's just um, a 
part of it. The reason I'm stating this is to know that she will not be able to talk about every single thing in the business plan this evening, but she's going to try as much. And then we might also have a follow-up session for her to complete. So I'm just going to introduce her. Her name is Buk as a, a, a leader tonight, I'll be our, the person that is pushing us through how to write a business plan tonight is Buki Adekonye. She's a multifaceted individual that started her entrepreneurial journey at the age of 13, um, selling homemade freezes to her neighborhood kids. She later went on to um, co-found the travel company. She's, she also founded it an SMB, SMEB's Info, um, which is a social enterprise that hosts a first of its kind platform. The platform co connects local businesses with the right information, opportunities and networks for growing their business. She currently works as an entrepreneurship facilitator at one of the immigrant serving organizations in Ontario, Canada. And she also mentors women, volunteers with many organizations and is a self-published author. Um, she holds a bachelor's degree in educational management and economics, and a master's in public and international affairs. So please help me welcome Buki Adekoye. Thank you so, so much. Uh, welcome. Now I'm down for yeah, it. Well, I don't even know where to start from again. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Um, and thank you for inviting me. Um, it's a, You're welcome. It's a privilege for me. And uh, thank you for showing up because that is important, you know, that you showed up. And um, I'm just um, trusting that we're going to have a very good time this evening talking about business plan. And before we go ahead, I just uh, want to get to know a bit more about the people we have here, the um, entrepreneurs, um, if you could just put in the chat, what kind of business you do. Um, I mean, if you don't have a business started yet, just um, put in what your business idea is, if you, and what stage you're at. So if you've started, uh, you can also put that in so that I'll just have an idea of, um, you know, the composition of the group. And also maybe if I need to make example, I'll know the kind of business I can reference easily. Um, so I will be checking in the chat to see what you have there. And um, just before we go ahead, I just wanted to also talk about how my relationship with business plans and it's, um, it's, been, a, it's been a love hate kind of relationship. Um, I will tell you how we got started. Um, so, in my final year in the university, I suddenly was face to face with the reality that I might not graduate because a file went missing. And so I decided, okay, what's next? I would start my business. I would um, uh, start a tailoring. I'm going to learn how to sew clothes. And then somehow I, I found myself um, at a business school, Faith Foundation, which I think should be about the oldest um, business school in Nigeria. Um, that was before LBS. And so when something happened, there was um, and one of the motives was that we needed to write a business plan. Now, of course, at that point, I had graduated, so I was no longer really serious about starting a business. I had, I was seven, and so I didn't take it serious. Um, but it was a business plan competition, and there was a little grant, you know, there was a monetary gift tied to it. And so I didn't, I wasn't serious about it anyway, but I went ahead and I wrote it. And um, the first three people were going to get a grant. And it just happened that I was number four. And I was like, wow, how did that happen? You know, so I felt like, hmm, so maybe if I put in a little more effort, maybe I could have won that grant. Like, I mean, like I didn't take it serious. And, you know, I was, I, I just narrowly missed getting that grant. So fast forward to 10 years later, I'm sorry, I'm going somewhere with this story. Five, fast forward to like to 10 years later, I was at a sales conference sitting with uh, about 10 guys. I was the only lady. And the conversation came up. Well, have you heard about you win? I'm like, what's you win? And they said, oh, this year's edition is for women only. And I'm like, okay, what's that about? So they said, oh, you just write a business plan. You get a grant from federal government. There was a guy there who said, I got 10 million naira last year. And we're like, last year, and we're like, ah, for real federal government? And he said, yes. And so I got curious. So, you know, he said he was going to introduce me to the person who helped him to write his business plan. I got the person's contact. I showed up at the person's office. I started to discuss my business idea. And then she said, oh, this is what we will do. Then we will write this and that and that. But I wasn't convinced. I was like, hmm, no, this person doesn't know my business 
as much as I do. So I decided I was going to write the business myself, uh, the business plan myself. Of course, I consulted with some friends who were experts and I won the grants. I won a grant because it wasn't, you know, there were about 66,000 people who applied, only like 1,200 people got the grant. And unbelievably, I was one of the people who got the grant. So that again, like reinforced my confidence and business plans. And, you know, of course, again, I forgot about business plans until I came to Canada. And I started to work as a business incubator, uh, which is also a visa designate for IRCC. And um, so we had the task of evaluating business plans of immigrants that want to come on the startup visa program. And so my work was to evaluate their business plan to check the technology, check um, if there was a market fit, check, you know, just do that evaluation, do a peer review. And so, again, I never thought I would, that was how many years um, after winning, you win, maybe like eight years. And so I never thought I would have anything to do with business plans again. So here I was in Canada and I had to review <coughs> business plans until, you know, like my whole day was about reviewing business plan. It was so bad. I got so tired. I felt like if I, if I had to read one more business plan, I was going to puke. So I left that job and I was looking for something else. And then I got another job. And um, during the interview, well, they were, okay, it's the role of an entrepreneurship facilitator, which wasn't bad. I just thought, mm, anyway, I need a job. And I got in and guess what? Now again, they have said I have to uh, teach business plans. So, I mean, I, I, I just feel like, okay, so that's what my journey with business plans have been, not exactly planned, but I, I mean, if that's the direction. What it is about. Pardon me? Okay, I thought I had somebody. Okay, so the reason why I said so is that um, a lot of time, you know, business, writing a business plan can be quite overwhelming because it's a whole lot. It's like, especially for an entrepreneur, you don't have the time to sit down and be putting paper or documents together. And then, you know, the tendency is for us to want to outsource it, get an expert to do it for us. But I shared that story uh, just to tell you that, first of all, it's not that difficult. Um, um, and I'll get into this, you know, there's a saying, how do you eat an elephant a bite at a time? If you're able to segment your business plan, if you're able to look at the different sections and then, you know, take them as individual documents and start to build them up, then it gets easier. Then the second thing is nobody knows your business like you, that's the truth. Um, and I can say that not just from my experience, but also from um, evaluating other people's businesses, because um, what happens a lot of times is that they give the agents, they get some business consultant to write for them, and you will always find a gap. And so, you know, we have to keep iterating, going back and forth to say, oh, this information is missing, and they'll be like, oh, I'll go back to the owner. And so that gap always exists if um, you get some, if, you know, you outsource it to somebody, and not to say you should not outsource to somebody, but also to say that um, there are some aspects of it that has to be done by you. And then if you feel like, okay, I still need some expert um, advice or, you know, like maybe this is not my strength, um, maybe uh, the financials is not my strength, then you can get some input from an expert. But um, it is your thing, you have to do it as the entrepreneur. So I'm just going to share my slide and I'm going to, in advance, I'm going to apologize, the slides are not fantastic. There's a little story behind it. Um, yesterday, I suddenly got locked out of my, I got locked out of my computer. So I spent all the time working on the materials for this uh, workshop and I could not access any of it. So I had to put this up to, you know, today. And um, so I apologize in advance. It's not very pretty, but if you I just, I promise you that once I'm able to get back into my computer, I will share um, something more beautiful. So um, thank you for sharing, letting me know what you do. I'm trying to get back into the chat. I think I'm gonna have to minimize this. Um, okay, so that I can, um, so we have people who are in the food industry, IT consulting, photography, media, um, logistics, travel, um, construction, food, catering, consulting services, Amazon business. Well, um, 
wholesale retail and clothing, beauty and makeup. And it's a whole wide range, but it's good to have a good feel of the people we have on the, on the group um, um, tonight. So a quick, um, just to give you an idea of what we'll be looking at today. Okay, I'm gonna have to wear my glasses, forgive me. Okay, why you need a business plan, how to plan your business plan, creating an executive summary, the different sections in a business plan and how to create a problem statement. I'm not sure we'll get to that this evening, but when, I mean, like if we fix another session, then I will get into that because I think it's really very important. Um, so to the purpose of a business plan, two things, three things, um, essentially. First of all, it's for you to be able to research and prepare for the market. Um, you know, like, and um, I'm happy that I was here, is the goal setting guru. And, you know, it's just um, like the, is it five piece? Um, okay, what's, what's that now? Preparation precedes, I can't remember how to say that, but long and short, uh, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. So um, one of the important things that you would realize as we get into business plan is the place of researching and preparing for the market. Um, and secondly, to create a blueprint. Um, and we'll get, we will also get to that in a, in a bit. And also to raise funds. So there are different um, schools of thought about a business plan. Why do I need a business plan? Why do I not need a business plan? Some people believe it is essentially for creating, for raising funds. So if you want, for example, to get venture capital, if you want um, someone to invest into your business or you want to get a loan or you even want to get a grant like I did, you need a business plan. That is what an investor will look at. That is what a bank will look at, apart from your financial statements before they give you um, a, a a loan or a grant or whatever it is. But much more importantly, I mean, like you might be, you might never need it. Let's say you never intend to, or you you do not have to uh, raise money for your business, but it is, it's a blueprint for you. It's, um, it's a guideline. And I think I'll just go to the next slide that speaks to it a little. And this is how I want you to think about your business plan. Think about your business plan as your business resume. So in the same way, your business plan is to your business, what your resume is to you. In the same way that when you're meeting with a potential um, employer, the first thing they want to see is your resume. And your resume is like a summary about you, where you've been, uh, your past, your present, and your future. And that's why you would usually start a resume with uh, your profession. What do they call that thing? I'm beginning to forget. But there's always that first paragraph where you talk about your goals, your professional goals or what you're looking for. I'm looking to get a job in this, I'm looking to develop myself in this or, you know, so that's what a business plan is for your business. Uh, it is also a roadmap. It helps you to chart the cost for your business. And that's so important. If you don't know where you're going, then how do you get there? So um, your business plan is your roadmap. It is also like your GPS and what it does for you is that it helps you to, just like when you're driving, you want to know, okay, so what's the uh, road saying today? What's the, what's the, where do you have what's on next? What areas do I need to avoid? Is there an accident somewhere? And also to help you get back on track, if for any reason you start to go off course. It is also, and this is important, an animate thing or animate objects. So you want to look at a business plan as a living thing. And what are the characteristics of a business, of a living thing? Um, in elementary science, so I don't even know if it was biology, but they told us some of the characteristics of a living thing is growth, reproduction, death. I think there are seven of them, but this has just me that I highlighted there. And uh, yes, a, a, a business plan is not static. It is dynamic. It is a working document. It keeps changing. You have to keep updating it. You have to keep doing more research, keep um, you know checking the market, keep improving your technology, keep just um, developing it. So it's not something that you write and drop somewhere. It's something you have to keep 
revisiting. And uh, reproduction, because when you get it right, it has the ability to also reproduce. You know, you could just, just based on, you know, um, the observation of the market, you could decide, okay, so it's time to get into this line of business. It's time to pivot and look at, okay, so what else can we do? Uh, we, all, we all witness the pandemic, we see how we affect a lot of businesses and only those who were able to pivot easily were able to survive the pan, like um, keep their doors open. And another characteristic of a living thing is that is death. And why do people die? They die because they age. And why, what was the process there? It's that you, your body parts start to degenerate and you cannot, um, you are not growing new ones. You are not, your cells are dying, right? Not you. But a person, when, when the person starts to age, their cells are not, um, they are not, well, their body is not producing new cells. And so the old cells start to die. And at the end of it, so it's just to say that if, you, if a person doesn't grow, they die. And it's the same thing for the business plan. Um, so let me see what do we have. So in planning your business plan, you have to think futuristically. You have to think uh, at where you are and where you want to go. You have to think holistically, think about the past. And in, when I talk about the past for you know people, if you've not had any previous business, um, it also means that you've had experiences, you have networks, you have knowledge, you have information. And that is why you decided on the line of business that you, 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 you decided on. And also your present, where are you at? You're able to look at what resources do I have? What resources do I need? What are the gaps that I need to consider? And um, the future, where exactly is it that you're going with this business or with this idea? Um, think interconnectedness. So one of the things that I, I learned from evaluating dozens of business plans is that, you know, people write different sections and they don't see how we connect. For example, um, if you look at your executive summary, I'll get to that in a moment. Your executive summary is the summation of the entire business plan. So there has to be that flow. Again, if you look at your financial statement, your financial statement is actually a summary of your business plan in figures. That's what it is. So if you're saying something in your business plan, then it has to reflect in your financials. If you say that some one of your uh, marketing strategy, for example, is to have billboards, then when you're writing your financials, that there has to be billboards in your financials. So you have to think of in terms of how all the sections are interconnected. Fine, um, each section is, yeah, so two steps to it, you have to look at each section as a standalone document. So when you're writing your um, marketing plan, you have to develop it like, okay, this is a whole document on its own. And that's, that helps you to be able to look at it from all the different angles. Then after you've done that, then you have to see, okay, how does my marketing plan fit into my revenue um, projection, for example? So if I, how does my sales plan fit into my um, revenue projection? How does my sales plan fit into my personnel plan, for example? So if I say that I'm going to make this amount of money, you know, by the end of the first year, how much, uh, uh, what kind of resources do I need to be able to achieve that? What kind of adverts do I have to place? What kind of um, staff do I need to employ to be able to generate that kind of income? So we have to look at it from that point of it being inter all the sections being interconnected. And the other part is you have to research. There is no way around it. And that, I think this is where a lot of entrepreneurs just um, get um, sidetracked because you, you just feel like you have a brilliant idea, you run with it, you start to create products and you don't even know what your customers want. And we will get, we, we will take a whole lot of time to delve into that in the next session because it is, that's one of the most important aspects of running a business and not just the businessman. So um, the particular template I shared with you, I hope that you've been able to download it. And um, the reason why, I mean like business plan templates are universal. Um, there, are, there are hundreds of them. But the reason why I chose this particular one is that it has, it, it has guidelines, it has some um, questions that will act as guidelines, excuse me, to, to help you to be able to build up on each section. And what I have done in addition to that is that I've also created some, because um, 
the, uh, it's a little, there was some information that I thought should be in there, but we're not there, but it was just a good template to use. So what I'd also done is to create additional section and also add notes. But uh, as much as you have that, don't, please, please, please don't ever be tempted to answer yes or no when filling out the section. So if they say, do you have this? Don't say yes. You have to be able to describe based on the research that you've done. Um, so, okay, I think I said this already. So we're gonna look at the business plan, look at the different section, take it section by section. Um, in advance, I want to apologize and ask for your um, permission. We might go a little over time just because there's a lot we have to do, but we will take it a section at a time. And these are the different sections we will be looking at this evening, the executive summary, business um, overview, the sales and marketing plan, operating plan, the team action plan, and what you're going to do your appendix. And I think that is all. I will stop sharing this screen. I'm not sure if I need to stop sharing it, or I just need to select. Can you see the business plan template now? Please let me know if you can see the template. We can see some internal executive summary. That's yeah. it. Exactly. That's yeah. That's it. Yeah. So, um, someone here is asking if we could share the template again. Can someone kindly help me put the link for the template in the chat? Um, okay. So, okay. So we will get into it. So, what is an executive summary? Um, like I said. It's it's um it's a summary. It's like the um it's just a summary of the business plan. So I have some notes I have put here. Uh, it's a complete document on its own. You have to realize that. So this is the point. When you give an investor, I mean some business plans run into 80 pages. Whoever you're giving it to is not going to, and I'm not encouraging that you write it if it's like like I used to be frustrated when I see. It's page business plans or 40 pages, but I mean like um, anywhere between maybe 30, 40 is okay. But the people you are dealing with, they are very busy executives. They don't have the time to go over 40 pages. And so this is like your pitch, your elevator pitch. Uh, we, do we know what an elevator pitch is? Of course we do. I'm assuming that we do. Um, so imagine that the person who's going to review this business plan has just five minutes to make a decision whether they want to continue reading. So this is where you will pull them in. And this is where it actually gets tricky because you have so much you want to say and you have so little space. So that's why you have to create content that will be engaging, convincing and stimulating and will make the reader want to continue reading. Um, and the other thing you need to know is that this is the last bit of you know, section you want to write in your business plan because you it's after you've completed every other section, you have done your research, you already know what's going into your business plan and um, that you will get to that you write this one. So it's the last one you want to write. Um, it shouldn't be more than two, three pages. And don't worry if you feel like you're leaving out some important, inf again, you have to identify what's more important, but don't worry if you feel like there's some detail you want to put in here because you will, as we go along, we find out that some of the session, sections are repetitive. Um, so you will have the opportunity to put in more details into those sections. So after one, uh, one of the outcomes of this, se this session is that I want you to be able to write an executive summary so that by the time next time we have this, um, our next session, you have an executive summary ready. And so I will just go over the components of an executive summary. So here, um, project objective, you talk about the nature of your project, what's that about? Um, what is the opportunity you've identified? Very important. Um, what are the timelines and what are your revenue targets? It's important. And um, of course, when you give revenue targets, then they have to be realistic. In fact, a little lower at the financial, there's a financial, um, projection or is a plan section, we'll get to that in a bit. If possible, it's advisable to put a sales forecast. It's just a line to stay year one. We will sell so many units and get this amount. 
year two, we will sell so many units at this price. Yeah, there has to be a price point and we will get this amount. So that, and yeah, I mean, some people put in graphs there. I just don't want anything complicated. You can use a graph, you can use a chart, you can use a table, but you know, keep it simple, but keep it realistic. You know, people tend to uh, just cook up figures. Somebody will say, oh, in our first year, we'll make $10 million. But by the time you go further down, look at the, you know, every other aspect of the business plan, their financial planning, their, uh, what else now, sales, you, you realize there's no way in the world you will make 10 million in, in 10 years. So you want to be realistic at this point, you're not just cooking up figures. And so um, you will find some, some section here that you don't have in your own template. And that's because I decided they were important and I put them in. And again, I'm going to share my own templates as soon as I'm able to get into my computer. Just, um, uh, just bear with me on that. And I consider this to be one of the most important aspects of business plan, problem definition and value proposition. Um, I am tempted to you know, quickly go back into the um, presentation, the slides and share quotes, but there is, okay, maybe I can say off the top of my head. Um, there is a saying that you should never get, don't get in love, get in love with the problem, not with the solution. And I will explain that. A lot of us entrepreneurs are so in love with our ideas that we think because it's a good idea, and this is a bit of an expo for next session, for the next session. Um, but you see, the, what is going to guarantee that your business will succeed is that you're solving a problem. And so you, are, you should concern yourself more about understanding the problem than creating a solution. And so that's why it's um, good that we are aspiring at this point. We don't have, imagine if a business has already started off on the wrong premise, you know, they've invested all the money and they go into the market and realize nobody wants my products and they have to fold up. And that's because they didn't take time to find out what the customer wants. And, you know, we, we get sentimental about our ideas, about our solutions. I have one brilliant idea. So that's the next, you know, it's a groundbreaking product or innovation. And because of that, I'm the next um, Mark Zuckerberg and the next, but we have not taken time to even get feedback from the client to know what exactly they want before we go ahead to create a product. So here you want to have questions about what's the problem that you're trying to solve. And here at this point, it's just at the hypothesis stage because you're assuming, you're assuming that's what your customer's problem is, but you have to validate it. So how did you validate this? You have to do a customer survey um, sometimes, for example, maybe um, there's an app, your competitors, and you see, oh, um, everybody's, you know, these are the negative reviews or feedback from customers using this app, and I want to create a similar product. So I'm just going to leverage that and fill that gap because you have identified that as an existing gap. There's a problem that the other cost, um, competitor has not been able to solve. So I'm just going to step in there and create that product. So uh, if you don't remember anything from the session, remember that the most valuable thing you could do in creating a business is to understand what the problem is. Okay, um, so how is this problem currently being solved by competitors? How do you intend to solve the problem in a way that creates more value for a customer? So don't forget that um, there is already an existing solution. Uh, for example, I mean like, even if you say, let, let's um, go back to 100 years or 500 years ago when there were no cars. And uh, say, you say, oh, so now I want to create a car. I don't have a competitor, but that's not true. The product you deliver is, your solution is getting people from point A to point B. Somebody's already doing that. Somebody, I mean, like, it could be they are tracking. They are getting from point A to point B. They are riding a donkey. They are still getting to, so those are your competitors. And a lot of time we will try to tell ourselves, oh, I don't have a competitor, but believe me, if you don't have a competitor, there's a problem. It might mean that you are, or if your business idea is something nobody else has ever done, there might be a problem with that. It means that maybe there is no need for it, it's not viable. And that's why nobody else is doing it. 
So competition, and of course that's not the point of uh, this section, is, is actually, it shows you that you're in a healthy market. And so we want to know what is already, what are the existing solutions? How is mine different? How can I add value? And when we've answered this question, effectively what we get is a product market fit. And that's like the most important part of you, what you want to produce. It means that you have researched and you found out that your product is what customers want to pay for. It's not just that, oh, I will create a product and now try to find someone to pay for it. No, people are already looking for it. And so when they find you, they, like, they are ready to give you their money. So we have to, that's, um, that's, that's, there's a terminology for it. It's called design thinking. So before we create, we have to put the customer at the center of it because the purpose of a business, um, according to Peter Drucker, is to create a customer, not to create a product. So I thought that was important. That's why I slotted this um, section in. And again, like I said, I will share it with you once I'm able to get into my computer. So here we go ahead and talk about the solution and it's assuming that we've done our market research, but you know, at this point it's still okay. You're working with your hypotheses. And like I said, your business plan, you have to keep refining it and keep iterating. And so here you're just describing your solution. What solution do you provide for your customers? How does your company fit within the current market? Um, are you a premium, you know, are you, um, um, in terms of what you do, how does it really fit in the market? Is it, what's your placement? What's your position and how are you um, perceived in the market? And in terms of the product or solution that you offer, what are the major initiatives? So here we'll talk about what your business activities are and it could be a wide range of so many different things. It could be that you offer consultancy at the same time you have that where you have software, you just want to talk about what you are doing in terms of your business activity. Location is important. Um, for example, I learned that if, if I can't remember whether it was TFC or Sweet Sensation want to cite a location, they will only go to where there's a Mr. Biggs because that tells them that market research has been done. Mr. Biggs has already confirmed that there are customers there. If there is no Mr. Biggs, they will not establish. So location is important. You know, not for every kind of business, but for certain kind of business, especially if you maybe you need um, a you need you have you expect to have working customers. It's a retail kind of business or proximity to uh, raw material, for example, if it's logistics. You know, um, you work with the parts, so that's forward and backward integration. Location is important. Um, here, if you have a history, it's okay to put it in there. If you and don't don't say because my business was in Nigeria, then I'm not, and I want to start in uh, Canada. It, it's not relevant. It's very relevant because what you've done is you've been able to establish a track record for yourself. So here, are products and services will get into this in deeper detail um, in subsequent session. Financial projection. Uh, I just thought here too, it's important to state what your capital, startup capital is, uh, because here you've identified how much money you acquire for the project. And what you have will show what the shortfall is. And of course, that's helping you to think in terms of how do I raise the um, gap, the funding gap that is existing. And uh, we will touch on that too in a bit. Here, you want to talk about the, the, the key people, the founders, um, do you have advisors? Do you have a management? But here, I think uh, for the executive summary, it's good to specifically talk about the founders. And of course, if you, um, at this point, I think this would relate more for an existing company. So you might exist, you might not bother talk about the team members that you would hire, except if you've already hired. If you have advisors or a team of directors, you might want to also state it. Um, then, of course, the experience and what their responsibilities are in the company. Uh, risk and contingency plan, this is all important um, because this will determine how you, you're prepared to be able to manage risk and, you know, if you're able to survive the risk. We all know what happened with the pandemic. A lot of people didn't see it coming. A lot of businesses were shut down as a result just because nobody thought the pandemic was a thing. 
um, you know, and this is a little bit of a slide. Uh, several years ago, when there was SARS pandemic in China, you know, we saw everybody wearing, if I even, I shouldn't go that far. Uh, when we saw everybody wearing, uh, what's it called now, mask in, what's the name of that country, uh, place where COVID started? We, it all looked so too far, like it could never happen to us, you know, but here we are. So um, being able to be, um, what's it called, having foresight, to be able to predict trends and what could go wrong and plan them. You know, as entrepreneurs, the good thing about us is that we are very uh, optimistic. We don't want to be pessimists. We have this brilliant idea. We're just sure it's going to work. We don't bother. We don't want to think about what could go wrong. I mean, we are Christians. We are rejecting this in Jesus' name. It's not going to happen. But we have to, and I know this is something Pastor Paju emphasizes all the time. So we want to look at every aspect of our business. What are potential threats, what are, what could go wrong? And then we start to plan. Um, and that will help us to be able to, um, when the storms come, we will be able to withstand them. Um, so here, yeah, like I said, there's going to be a bit of repetition. So I might skip over some of the things I already touched on in the executive summary. Um, of course, you, you have your mission statement, vision statements, organizational values, culture, what you want to, you know, implement. And if you have questions, um, maybe put them in the chat. I might, I will get to, um, um, I think maybe I just want to go, you know, along first. You know, your food. And not have um, a lot of distraction, um, interruptions. But please put your comments in the chat. I will look at them. And if I think that it's something that is relevant to what I'm saying, or, you know, I want to answer them immediately, then I'll get to it otherwise. At the end of the session, we will have a question and answer uh, time. Um, so business structure and ownership. Um, okay, so this was not here and I put it here just because it's important. What's the legal structure of a business? Is it going to be a sole proprietorship, corporation, um, partnership, cooperative? Uh, so there's a, I mean, you can read up on all of this. And there's a whole lot of difference in how these are set up and all the legal requirement. Um, are you going to be the sole founder or are you going to be, um, is it going to be a shareholding kind of business um, where you have other founders? What are the, their percentages? Do they have voting rights? Does your business own any intellectual property? And this is important because um, um, intellectual property, they apart from them being monetizable, they also kind of put, um, uh, what's it called? Make your business kind of more difficult to replicate for competitors um, or to copy. It kind of, um, it kind of sets you aside as your business being a high barrier, how do you say that now? High barrier of entry. So it's not as easy. You've established that this is a unique kind of business because we have some kind of maybe proprietary um, technology that we're using or just patents that, you know, we have the sole rights to nobody can copy. But again, you have to decide and be knowledgeable about this to know what kind of intellectual property you are if you want to go with that and what kind of strategy you would use uh, if you want to register a patent, which means that, for example, if it's an industrial, and please, again, let me know if I'm going too fast. You can put, put some in the chat. If, I, if you want me to speak slower, let me know. So if you have to register a patent, for, um, that will apply to, if you have a physical good and you can register, the industry, industrial design, for example, if you want to create a bottle like this and you just, the shape, you describe everything and you say, uh, I have a, a patent on this and nobody can replicate this exact design. It doesn't mean somebody can go and put an extra line to their own. That just means it's not gonna be the same. Um, also often a lot of our businesses have copyrights, things like even the products manual, you can copyright that your brand, you can trademark that. And then you could also, and now I'm already talking about strategy and the strategy, you could decide that my, my uh, strategy, IP strategy is that it's trade secret. 
So for example, one of the strongest um, brands that has survived several decades is Coca-Cola and they are not patented. The product itself is not patented. It's trade secret because you know, again, that the downside again to patenting is once you're patent, once you've patented, it's out in the public, someone can go and reverse engineer it. And so if I already, it means that you, everything that goes into that, you will put it in. You're only saying you are not, nobody's allowed to go and use this and this and this and this exact same formula. But it doesn't mean that they cannot go and use another formula and get the same result. So, you know, it's, um, you know, you have to decide what works better for your kind of product. If you think it's something that cannot be revised, reverse engineered, then you might want to patent. And um, then again, if you're looking for investors or equity and capital, venture capital, they usually like products that have patents. So these are things you, you would have to um, think through, maybe get an IP lawyer to help you look into all the options that you have. So here it's important that you know what's happening in your industry. Uh, in the market that you want to play in, what are the trends um, that could have, what's happening currently, what, 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 have, what are the latest developments, what, in what direction is this market going, is there an uptick, is the, do you think that this market is expanding or is this declining, um, if it's declining you might want to rethink going into that kind of market or just look for a difference, there's a way you can Create, and that's why, again, never fall in love with your idea. Your solution might be needed in another market and not in the market you've chosen. So it's important to understand the trends in the market that you want to enter it. So um, what are the, what's the population? Are your customers getting older and what's the implication for that? If your product is one that is um, designed for seniors, then that's good news. It means that, um, you know, your population is aging. So it means that, a market is opening up. Um, however, if your product is for, I mean, like you just want to look at all that dynamics to decide if you have the right products for the right market or if you want to make some changes there. Um, is it at risk of being obsolete, forcing you to change? I mean, these days you can't even, things have happened so quickly that all you're thinking of is how to pivot. I'll give an example. You know, someone said, a consultant said that his, um, his clients, what they do is eyeglasses. And so during the pandemic, they lost a lot of business and they were thinking of how do we um, remodel, how do we work on our business model? And he said that they had to look, okay, so what other business um, has sim a similar model or similar offering? And guess what, you won't believe it. They decided it's pizza. So when you're buying a pizza, you know, where you're allowed to choose your topping, choose your filling and all of that, they said it's the same model for eyeglasses. You can buy the frames, um, but, but for the lenses, it has to be, you know, I, do, you know, I use glasses, but I don't know all those um, metrics. But so you have to be versatile like that to know, okay, so if I, I could actually offer the same service to, um, so an eyeglasses company that I'm offering to a pizza company. So that's what, where innovation kicks in. And um, just by understanding the trends in your industry, you know how to pivot, pivot when there is a need to. Technological trends are also important. I can't, we can't even emphasize this enough. Um, because I worked in, um, the business incubator I worked in was also, um, it is also uh, an innovation center. And I, I saw how your business, you have to, by all means, incorporate some form of technology. Um, just because technology is the new normal, everything is digital, everything is online. Our minds are beginning to be trained in that way to think in terms of technology. And uh, you have to find a way to leverage technology to make your offering either reach your clients faster or make the delivery easier for them, um, increase their, uh, improve their user experience, or you know, just think in terms of how can I use technology to better deliver the products and service I am offering, even if it's not a technology product. 
So you have to understand the regulations, different regulations for different industries, especially if you are in a field that is highly regulated like healthcare, there are a whole lot of um, regulations that you have to be aware of so that you don't fall foul. Even if you're in construction, there are a lot of regulations. You just have to understand how these things work. And again, the place of um, researching your business for starting cannot be overemphasized. Um, so to the market, this is also a very important aspect of what we'll be looking at. Um, what kind of customers, what's, what's your target market? What's your ideal um, um, customer profile? We'll get to that in a minute and I will share a link with you where you can create your customer um, avatar. Uh, what's the size of the customer group? This is important. Is it growing? Is it changing? Is it reducing? You have to know what the overall, um, so there is a formula. I will put that, I have it in the other, document, I don't have it here. Um, you have to know what your total addressable or available market is. You have to know what your serviceable um, available market is. You have to know what your share of market is. So in that sense, you know what the overall, uh, for example, say, what's the value of the market? Um, the entire marketing in Canada, for example, oh, okay, there. Yeah. They are Canadians here anyway, or in the US, or if your business is located in Texas and you've decided you are restricting, you don't intend to go beyond Texas, what's the total market size, total available market there in Texas? Because that will determine how much market share you can get, and that will determine if your revenue projection is realistic. It will determine if you're able to make a profit and actually run a business sustainable, sustainably. Or if you want to start thinking and looking into other market segments or you decide, okay, I'm going to have to expand this beyond Texas because there's a larger market somewhere. So it's important to understand what the market size is. Um, market customer behavior, how do they, what influences their decision making in terms of their uh, budget spent, who makes the decision? What influences them? I'll give an example here. And that speaks a little to target market. Um, so somebody, if a family wants to buy a car, who is your idea? Who is the target market? Who is the decision maker? You might think, well, this is the person, it's the father that would, you know, the mom is a stay-at-home mom, she doesn't work. So the man is the one who is going to make the decision. But guess what? The man is only making financial decision. To a large extent, the woman also is a major decision, you know, decision maker because she's the one who will tell you, oh, we have four kids. We need um, to be able a, a van so that we can have a car seat for the baby, you know? A man might not think in terms of the inside interior of the car, might think just of the external, the exterior, it's fine, the speed, the all of that. And again, guess what? The children too will be like, oh my goodness, my mom's, uh, my friend's mom has this kind of car, it's beautiful, let's buy. So there are different kind of decision makers and you have to understand what roles they play and who influences. You might think because this person is the one who is putting the money down, that's the person I want to go after. But it might not, they might not actually make that decision. So you have to identify who is the decision maker. For example, um, if, if, for example, your product said that you're creating or retailing a product uh, for children, and um, you might want to think, okay, so let's say a health device uh, is what you're, you're creating. So you might think, oh, I will sell it to the hospital, or I will um, sell it directly to the client, or you might have to find a distributor, you know? So you have to identify where exactly, who are the people in the value chain for uh, getting my product to the market? Um, so I will move on just because of our time. So here, I'm gonna put this in the chat and you will get all of this resource. Again, not this evening, uh, but I will share them with you before the next session. Um, Okay, just gonna second. So what I have here is, you know, a personal generator, a personal generator. So if you go into that site, you would be able to 
create an ideal client profile. And again, that's it's still at the hypothesis level that you will have to test, but I mean, for it's a good place to start. And there's something they say about your ideal client. They say you have to be able to define them so well. You, you know, you have to be, as some people will say, oh, well, I'm targeting all moms in, in Ontario, where I live, for example, every woman that has a child aged um, zero to three. But that might not be your perfect avatar. Um, it might be the woman who has a job, full-time job, who, or some the woman who is trying to get back into paid employment. And you have to be able to describe what's her life experience, what's her journey, what's her professional experience, and you know, stream, make it as streamlined as possible so that when your customer sees your product, they recognize it. The problem a lot of times is that we are so broad and we think the broader we are, the better. We think we want to give ourselves a, the leeway so that we're able to capture more people into our um, you know, target market. But the problem is if you are not clear, you know, if your uh, messaging is not as clear as a bell, you confuse people. They don't know what you're about. So your customer will be staring you in the face, looking at your product, but they don't know, they don't know they are your customers. And there's this um, saying, uh, you know, this thing I learned while I was at Faith Foundation about a customer. You sh your customer should be so clearly defined that if you are in Toronto, for example, and forgive me, I'm using the example. It's, it's a very, I don't live in Toronto, it's a very busy place. And there, uh, you are in downtown Toronto and there are hundreds of people on the road. You sh if you see your customer, you should be able to, not because you know the person or oh, this person has bought from me, but you should be able to point and say, yeah, that's my customer because you've, had, you've been able to define their profile so well. She's um, age 15 to 35, you know, she, uh, what are her likes, what are her dislikes, what are her spending habits, you know, what, what kind of places does she visit? Um, so when you see that young lady who has a backpack, who has the airplugs, who is in um, subways, you know, that is my customer just because you've been able to streamline your definition of your customer so well. So I think that's one of the things that this um, link I shared with you will help you to be able to achieve. Um, products and services, here I have some notes because it's important. And again, it's just because if you are going to have a third party reviewing or reading your business plan, they have to be able to understand your product and service and how it works. So, um, you know, a lot of us feel like, oh, I don't want to put all the information. We keep by just so close to our hearts that we don't want to put the information, but by um, being stingy with this information, you're confusing people, you're confusing an investor, you're confusing. If I don't understand your products, then how do I know it's for me? So you have to be able to, uh, describe your product from end to end without necessarily divulging proprietary information. For example, um, what are the components of your products? Does it have a hardware? Does it have a software? If it's a learning kit, what does it include? Does it have, I mean, like, you know, just break it down in that sense. And um, using a software, excuse me, using a software for an example, um, what are the different interfaces? In fact, it doesn't, this doesn't only apply to a software. Um, even if it's a product, if it's, um, you have a retail and people will walk in to your store to pick up stuff, what is the journey map for them from the point when they enter through the door to the time when they walk out of the door again? What are the touch points? Um, at what point are they going to have to interact with somebody? Um, how do they navigate? So all those, details, well, it doesn't have to be to that extent of detail, but um, it's good to be able to define this thing clearly, especially if your product um, is a software or if you're offering a service. And it's also good to be able to, uh, if, if it's a technology-based kind of product, you want to state the kind of technology you'll be using precisely. Um, and of course, you don't, well, you don't need to say how you're going to connect all of this, but you just want to say that these things do exist. And the reason why, again, that I say this is, uh, still using the software as an example, and forgive me, it's just because I have worked with so many technology kind of business plans. Um, so someone has an app for a senior that is supposed to record their vital 
science and um, store it up somewhere in the clouds. So after you've stopped, stored it, what next? So for example, if is there going to be an interface that links this so that it is reporting directly to the doctor's office? So if you say you're creating an app that would help seniors, you know, who are live, uh, how, what do they say this now? Seniors that um, are in, that are, I can't remember what he said, but those who have decided to have aged so much, they are aging in place, that's what they call it. So you want, and they don't have caregivers 24 seven, you have created an app that's going to be able to monitor their vital signs. You want to say, okay, so if it's out of range, what happens next? Is there going to be a connectivity to the doctor's office such that the doctor's is alerted once something is out of range? So they can act immediately. So you want to describe all those interfaces. If what you have is a platform, a website, um, you want to describe what is what is the buyer. And you, okay, so imagine you have a marketplace. You, somebody mentioned that they have a, an Amazon kind of business. What is the marketplace like for the buyer and for the seller? You have the buyer, you have the seller on two ends. You know that their interfaces are not going to be the same. The user experience interface for the um, buyer is different from the seller. It's your platform. You want to be able, because they are both your customers, the buyer and the seller. So you want to be able to describe both interfaces. Um, okay, now I'm getting conscious of time. Competitors, and this is important. We, you know, a lot of us see our computers as our enemies, you know, the kind of enemies you pray that they'll fall down and die, but they will not fall down and die. They are very important, very, very important because uh, a lot of times we build up on what, that's what, you know, it's all about. We build up on what our cost competitors have already established. So first of all, they give us the case study. They give us like a benchmark to start to build upon and um, show us, they help us to realize what gaps are available. And it doesn't matter if you're a small company and um, you feel like your competitor is an IBM, for example, or your competitor is um, uh, Johnson & Johnson, and you, you are just trying to create a small, you know, it's not small because you're not small, but you know, they might look like a threat to us, but they are actually our case study. They are the ones that we will study. And uh, someone once said, if you want to innovate, this is what you do. It's not, don't take this literally, you know, but just to give you an idea how competitors could also uh, add value to our product. Look at what your competitor has done and look for 10 ways in which you can improve it. But then again, if you decide to go that route, don't forget you're looking at it from the angle of the customer. So if you are going ahead to add this and add that, and um, the customer, it's not useful for the customer. You've just wasted your time. So competitors are actually, it's healthy to have competitors. And so you have to identify who are your direct competitors, who are your indirect competitors. Uh, who are those who sell similar products? Who are those who sell substitute products? Um, yeah, okay, it says here already indirect. Um, are these companies, are they, are they already solving the problem you're trying to solve? Or what's your, what value are you adding to your value chain that would make your customers, because don't forget what you're trying to do is this is the pie. They already have some percentage. You are a new insurance, except you have a product that, and that's, that's rare, that um, it's totally new, you know, it's, and that's quite rare. But even for, okay, so, uh, okay, let me not go that route. So what you're trying to do is take some shares from your competitors. So what you know also means is that you're trying to take their customers. Why should their customers leave them to come to you? That's one question you have to answer. You have to look at it in terms of, uh, and there is a table that should be here. Look at it in terms of, is it the ease of delivery? Is it the customer service I am offering? Is it the customization? Because again, the other thing about advantage of being a small business is it helps you to be able to customize. Um, big businesses might not be able to immediately um, adapt 
to be able to customize to certain needs. It might take them a while because they have their processes, they have to, but so those are the advantages of being a small business. You can easily, quickly identify those gaps and fit into it. But you are not just going into the market to be a uh, me too. You are identifying what your unique niche is in the market and that is what you want to feel. Um, so you have to be realistic when you are talking about your customer strengths and weaknesses. Don't underplay their strengths. Don't exaggerate their weaknesses. Where do you see them as vulnerable? Be realistic, do your market research. How, what are they doing successfully? Give it to them because if you are not real, telling the truth, you're not helping yourself. Um, what are your co competitive advantage? Now, again, this speaks to your value proposition. And this is something we will touch on. You know, we already did the problem definition. Another core part of it, I think I touched on it, is your value proposition. I haven't identified the problem you're solving. Well, how are you solving it in an effective way that makes the customer want to come to you? Those, that's your value proposition, that's your competitive advantage. Um, yeah, so again, what makes the customer choose your products over competitors are free? What's different about you? What's unique about your solution? Um, your, is it your distribution channel? For example, if you're competing with a, co a company that is brick and mortar, but you have an online store and you're able to deliver to your client, that is a competitive advantage over them because a client like me, you know, would rather sit in the house and have it delivered to us than going out. Um, again, if you provide your client with the ease of, um, you know, that's why this, this technology is so, 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 it's, it's you know, it's small ideas um, that people just launch and it becomes a big deal. For example, you know, someone could have a business idea when people people want people who are not taking and need to buy gadgets, go online. They are confused. There, there are too many websites. Everybody's buying online now. You don't know which is true. You don't know which is false. But are you able to create um, a technology that will help people find reviews for each of the product, compare products across um, all the different marketplaces, and um, share reviews and share advantage? I mean, like. That in itself is a product. It doesn't look like you've created anything, but it is a product some people would buy. So um, again, those are kind of things you want to look or that you want to add on to what you already have that makes you very competitive. Um, so I have a table I will share with you for this competitive analysis chart. And what you're doing here is you're comparing the, your product and services, their features, functions, and your business model. And here, uh, you know, a lot of time, what a lot of business owners do is they just put in their business jargons, their language. Um, you put in, my product has AI, it will use algorithm, it will, or my product, uh, we clear a skincare product, for example. It, it will give my customers shinier skin in three months. My competitor's product, it will take seven months. But you are not exactly saying, what problem does it solve? And the second example may actually not be, it's um, very spot on. But what exactly, when you are doing it, it's totally, completely from the viewpoint of the customer. Don't use it, use jargons here. You have to be able to see, look at this in terms of what are the benefits to the customer that my product will deliver that the other products will not deliver one, two, three, four, five. Customer, uh, competitor, one, two, three, four, five. So these are. So what you're doing is you're comparing features across board. Um, my, uh, I am into a logistics service. I'm a logistics service provider, and we do last mile. So last mile means they will get it at their doorstep. I order things from Nigeria, for example. I don't want to deal with someone who will say, go to Mississauga to go and get it. I want somebody who will bring it to my house. So if I have two people who uh, do delivery and I have to travel even to the next town, and there's someone who will charge me an additional $30 to have it at my doorstep, I will go to, with the person who will charge me that extra. So those are those um, things you want to compare and contrast with your 
competitors to show how your own self, your own offering is better. In terms of business model, business model is simply what brings in money. How do you earn money? So uh, your business model could be that you earn money through sales of products, physical product. It could be subscription based. It could be that you charge a consultancy fee. It could be that you charge a licensing fee. So all of that, it's good to outline it. And believe me, for your business, the more the streams of income you have, the better. So don't stop at, we only supply. Do you also do uh, repairs and maintenance? Do you also provide consultancy uh, for subscription-based models? Uh, do you have layered kind of subscription? Are you going to, um, do you have freemium? And that's what a lot of people do. They will say, download this. You have limited features if you want to upgrade. Then do you, so be able to layer your offerings so that um, by all means, you are dragging people in, you can entice them with the free. But once you want this more important feature, you have to pay for it. And, you know, for example, I was thinking about uh, WhatsApp, for example. I'm like, why does WhatsApp, not uh, do, I know it does, how, how do you say this now? When you're typing and it's suggesting, it prompts you, it's um, auto, auto correct. Auto correct. Yeah, thank you, auto correct. But what it doesn't do that a Gmail, for example, does a Google Sheets does is, it doesn't, after you've typed, before you send, it doesn't come and tell you, oh, there's a grammatical error or there is a, you should have put, you, you know, you left us an article. And believe me, I know, I'm convinced it's deliberate. They don't want to give you everything at once so that you get bored and you're looking for the next thing. You know, because there's no reason why um, that you don't, like everybody, everybody else is doing it. So why are they not doing it? You know, and that's why a lot of time you type, you, and I do that a lot. You, after typing, you now go back and you saw you made a mistake and you're like, oh, sorry, typo. So it's those kind of, Okay, if you want that um, additional layer of service, then you should be able to pay extra money for subscription based. So that is speaking to your business model. And also your price point, you have to be able to talk about your price point. Um, how much will you charge per unit? And that's important because you want to know what are your competitors charging? A lot of people say, oh, I don't know what my competitors are charging. So how do you know that your pricing is, um, is good? How do you know that? people will leave competitors. Like how are you even competing when you don't know what your competitors are charging? So you do, it means you don't know whether you would, people will buy your products or not. Because if your competitors are charging far lower than what you're charging, why should you, and that's not to say uh, it's wrong, but then you have to be able to answer the question why based from a place of knowledge. So that's why all of this is important. And again, it speaks to, um, your research. So here I have SWOT analysis, and I think this was but specially requested by, I think it was Dr. Duny and um, yeah, uh, the Canadian crew that they mentioned SWOT analysis, so I thought I'll put this in. Um, so your SWOT analysis, again, is similar to your risk assessment. What are the things that can work for your business? What are the things that can work against your business? What are the, you know, what is strength, weakness, opportunity, threat? What are the strengths? It could be that you have groundbreaking technology. I mean, again, you know, I forget what I said about um, don't fall in love with your idea, but if you have a groundbreaking technology, then it's a strength. If your team has the right kind of expertise, then it's a strength. If you have access to the right kind of information or data bank, it is a strength. It's working for you. What are your weaknesses? Things that are not working for you. It's an insufficient fund. There's a skill gap. You don't have all the um, necessary skill you need on your team to be able to take your products to market. Um, you are new to the market. And I think that's, you know, for all of us, we are in new countries. Um, and we are starting business maybe on familiar terrain, that could actually be a weakness, but not to say that it cannot be overcome. And so again, the idea behind identifying this is so that you know how to position, so you know what you're working on, so that you know what you're putting forward. Um, your opportunities, for example, you're the first on trend, um, you're first to market with, not to say somebody's not doing, okay, so take example, a car, 
um, when there was a time that it was just, um, what do they call this, manual transmission, and you have, um, you have automatic transmission. Of course, that is a strength. That's an opportunity because you are the first um, bringing that kind of technology into the market. Again, there could be another side to it, which is which it could take a while, um, you know, for customers to get used to it. You know, I remember when they when somebody shared the story that when people when they introduced um, introduced automatic transmission cars and mechanic would say, oh, ah, sorry, I want to speak to you you say, well, I yourself. I don't know if you know what that means. But if you're driving a manual car and it stops in the middle of the road, then you will, you're, when you're, they're pushing you, say, yeah, yourself, yourself, you can jump start it. But uh, uh, automatic car, when it's dead, it's dead. And there's nothing, I just push it and park it, it's not going to start. So again, it's um, being front. First, and trying also means you have to be able to market, you have to be able to sell the advantages to customers. So, but it is not a weakness. It is, it's not, it's right, it's an opportunity you can take advantage of. Favorable policies, there are certain, um, in, I mean, like the pandemic has its good and bad side. There are some industries or sectors that have now emerged and the government is funding and putting forward uh, to as a means of economic recovery um, just because of pandemic. So is there a policy you want to find out in your industry? Is there any such policy? Is there any um, tax cut back or rebates that you can you know, enjoy just because you're working, for example, if your business is an environmental based kind of business or if it's um, and, um, the kind of technology that encourages um, social physical distancing, um, just look at, if there are new policies, if there are opportunities, if there are fundings from governments or grants, um, you know, it could be anything that will be favorable for your business I can tap into. Um, it's in the field of interest, yes. Yeah. So again, renewable energy, if that's what you're into, you know that's what uh, the government is interested in. If you are in, you know, um, some kind of technology for agriculture, um, there, you could find a grant for that. If there's a growing demography, um, so look at all of those sites to it. Um, threats, are there government policies that might make it difficult to enter into the um, um, industry? Are there new entrants or could there be new entrants in the future with more innovative solution? And then again, this is where your research and development, you know, comes in. As a new department, a new business, you have to have a research and development um, department in quotes. It could means you could outsource it, you could pay for it, you could, um, excuse me, get a consultant to be on it, but you have to continue to evaluate the trends and know where you need to improve. There is never a finished product, and that's why you have iPhone, what's the latest now? I, forgive me, I don't know, but I think it's 14, I might be wrong. And that's because there's just some new technology that is emerging. That's why apps, you will see a better version um, 2.1.0, then tomorrow there's another version. You, you have to continuously improve your version of the product. There is never a finished product. That is one thing you need to know because somebody will come tomorrow that has a more innovative solution and they, would, they could take over the market potentially. And if you think, you know, another thing, a mistake that, um, some entrepreneurs make is you want to compete based on price and you say, oh, I'm going to sell cheaper. Are you kidding? Except if you find a technology that helps you to be able to deliver the product at a fraction. And of course, again, that's inched on the technology that you've discovered. So if you're able to slash the price by maybe um, to maybe 10, what's it called now? One over 10 of what it is, then you can say you're competing price-wise. but Apart from that, pricing can never be a key um, success factor for you because someone will come who, okay, this is um, India abroad, but in Nigeria, for example, as an example, someone will come who just wants to launder their money. 
Then we sell what you are selling for 1,000, it's 100 Naira. That's it, you're out of market. So those are the kind of things you have to look at, potential threats. And it's again, it's not because you're being pessimistic, pessimistic, it's just that you're being realistic. You're looking at it from every angle. And there's a saying, everything that can go wrong will go wrong. Um, well, again, it might not be so, but you know, you just want to be prepared for the worst, expect the best, prepare for the worst, so that if it doesn't happen, then you're fine. Are you kidding? Are we still in the second? Oh my goodness, I think, let me see, what page are we on now? What page is this? I can't even see the page initial. Anyway, so the marketing, I think this is a little repetitive. Um, so sales and marketing, who are your customers? Do you have um, a few customers? Are your customers diversified? It's important, except if you're in a very, very defined niche market. And um, for example, if you're in oil and gas, you know you have a restricted kind of, uh, cost clientele base, but they are, they are high paying clients and that might be okay. But yeah, at the same time, you're also trying to look at how to diversify that in case something goes wrong and that stream of income shuts down. Um, so suppliers, why are your suppliers? Are you also depending on just one or two suppliers? What if they run out of business? What's gonna happen to you? Um, how are you sourcing your points to know here? How are you sourcing your raw materials? Are they seasonal raw materials? If yes, how would you manage um, shots falls, you know, in supplies when they're out of season. Uh, season Will they be sourced locally? Will they be sourced regionally or um, internationally? And why? If you want to source from China, you have to, I mean, like, yeah, you know, it might just be because they have better quality, they have better price, they have higher supply, um, they can supply higher units, but just you have to be able to define that so that you don't run out of um, inventory, which also means you're running out of um, business. Um, advertising and promotion. How will you attract potential customers to your point of sales? Are you going to use your website, digital marketing, content marketing? Would you place adverts on Google, Facebook, YouTube, affiliate marketing? Are you going to be out on the streets marketing or are you going to use billboard? You have to be able to define all of those things. And again, this speaks to your target market. Where are they? Are they out on the streets? Are they on the internet? Are they in, um, in old people's, you know, where are they seniors? If they are seniors, where would you find them? Um, and then again, who are the influencers? in the industries, what associations do you need to join? What networks, professional bodies do you need to participate in trade shows? Have you identified some of those? Um, are there partnerships that will give your brand visibility? For example, you might decide that um, my product is for school age kids, so what can I do? I might want to partner with the school board in my area. I might want to do a community project that involves parents, that involves um, people in the educational sector so that they identify with my brand and they know. And again, the other thing about doing business is you have to be genuine. People know when you have been tokenistic and you're just um, handing them tokens just for something. So you have to be genuinely interested and um, then also create partnerships that will help you grow. Pricing and distribution, what's your pricing strategy? I think I talked about that already. Um, how are you going to price? Are you going to be premium? Are you going to price average range? Are you going to look at, okay, what's everybody else in the industry doing? Then I'll find the average and I'll stick there. Or am I going to just um, be at the bottom uh, price low just because my target market, that is what they can afford. And then it, and they are being left out. So you are looking at an underserved market and uh, maybe because they cannot afford. And, you know, there's an example, of, you know, um, anyway, I will reserve that for next week. Uh, but then again, you, you have to know why you're pricing. You have to have a pricing strategy. And how did you arrive at your sales price? What's your total cost, production cost? A lot of time, we, we, don't, we don't do that correctly. You are not pricing your internet. You are not pricing the software um, that you are using. You are not pricing because you use your car, you are not pricing um, the insurance you place on your car, you pay on your car, you're not pricing the fuel you use in your car. 
uh, you use your phone line to do business, you are not pricing that. And so your pricing is not realistic. You are not making profit and you think you're making profit. So those are things that we have to look at. Your customer service policies, um, how will you manage customers' feedbacks, their inquiries, their complaints? Do you have a structure in place to be able to attend? Customer retention, if you have one satisfied customer, they will tell five more people. If you have an unhappy customer, they'll tell 25 people. So, and one of the best, you have to be able to build a relationship with your customer to the extent that they become your brand advice, um, brand, uh, what's it called now? Brand ambassador. So thank you, thanks for, thank, thank you for chipping that in. So you have to look at what structure you have in place. Um, how would you support the customer? If you are so business so now, you can't be available 24 seven. Are you going to use customer representative? Are you going to use technology on your website so that they can fill in a, the chat box, um, the chats box, the robots on your website can talk to them, help them solve their problem? Are you going to have a Q and A um, section? In your on your website, are you going to have some video that shows them how to troubleshoot? To troubleshoot, you have to think about all of these things, uh, you know. And of course, you can't implement everything at once. Again, how do you use an elephant? Elephant, a bite at a time. So you have to think of how you are um, structuring that one after the one after the other. Um, so Lou, I see your hand up. If you could put your question in the chat. That will be, oh, okay. Oh, that's the host. Please go ahead. Yeah, I want to tell you that you should please check your WhatsApp. Okay, sorry. Yeah. I Thank you. No problem. Okay, so I'm trying to wrap up now. Let me see. Um, operating plan. Um, I'm just going to skip over to, um, because I mean, one of the reasons why I shared this with you ahead was so that you can go by. Um, I will just go to the place, to the notes that I have added. Um, so for your management team, and this is very important, what skill do you have? Are you the sole provider? That's the place to start from. Are you the only person running this business? Do you have intention to get partners on the business? Are you going to hire? What skill do you need to, um, what skill do you have as the owner of this business and maybe your co-founders? that will ensure that is the business succeed. You have to spell it out in your business plan. Do you have a team of advisors that might help because you're not, you don't know everything. You need people who you can lean on for information um, and they, for the expertise. And for building your team, you need to have do a skill assessment, identify all the skills you need to take your product to market, starting from um, your market research, your production, your marketing, your sales, your advertising, your and also the support um, services like your HR, your uh, what else, financial management. Do you need an accountant? Do you need uh, you know every single thing? Then decide what which of the skills do I have personally as the business owner. If I don't have everything, what are the options? How do I fill these gaps? Am I going to hire? And hiring could be part-time or full-time, or you want to get a consultant. Another very viable option that we hardly, you know, look at is co-founders, a partner. And it's important because first it will save you money. Um, so instead of me hiring, if I needed somebody to develop technology for me, it could cost me as much as if I had to hire maybe $80,000 a year, but if I have a co-founder who has that skill, they bring in their skill, we share the equity. And again, we are, I know that we have, it's like marriage. You want to be careful when you're bringing it to your business. Um, do you want to use the software to automate some part of your um, business? And again, if, um, let me quickly chip this in on Friday, my team established a business on us um, group. We have an expert who's gonna be talking to us about automating your business processes. So if that's something you want, you are interested in, I can, I will share the information with your team leader and they will pass that across to you. Um, so this is the last lapse. Thank you for staying on up till now. I think we are now starting to wrap up. An action plan, it's important. It's not just enough to make all these plans. How are you going to execute? Um, and I, Taiwo can tell you a whole lot more about execution, planning and execution. 
Um, there is a table here, it's quite simple, but I like this particular one and it is actually easy to create. You just need to use an Excel sheet to create um, a Gantt chart and it's going to, it's, it's going to, um, let me see. Okay, so here we are just going to mimic this Gantt chart and use it to create milestones for your business um, and add timelines to them. So uh, preferably, ideally, you, you should have two charts. Uh, one for your business activities generally, market research, funding, hiring, product development, all of that. So you will put those activities to your, which one is this? Is it Y-axis or X-axis? I don't know math. I didn't do well in math, but you, you know what I'm talking about. The This is vertical, yeah? Uh, vertical side of it. The horizontal is the timeline. When exactly are you going to achieve this? It's not enough to say you want to do something, but you want to put a timeline to it. The other chart is going to be about your products um, and service milestone. If you're developing a product, if you are sourcing materials, if you are whatever it is you have to do, if you have to purchase, if you have to manufacture, um, put that in the chart to add timelines to it and keep measuring your progress to be sure that you are on track with your plan. And if you have to make adjustments, then you have to revisit that plan. And remember that in creating your goals, they have to be smart goals. Um, okay, I think we touched on this already. And I think that will be all to date. Thank you for your patience. I know that we went over time uh, at this point. I don't know if we have time for questions. Um, so um, we'll take a few questions if there's any. So if anybody has any questions, can you please raise your hand um, okay. so that um, she can answer it quickly. We'll take like two questions. And then I, I can say that if you have any extra questions, you can send the um, questions and I'll forward it to Bukni. Yeah, um, yeah, for, yeah, yeah. She can address this in the second session or she can send Yeah, it. for sure. And I was also going to say that if you have specific area that you want us to explore um, or just shed more light on second session, in the next session, we'll look at it. But primarily we'll be looking at the customer and the products. Remember we said your business about creating your customer and then we look at the product aspects of it. But if you have anything, other aspects you want to talk about, we will look at it in the next session. So I will just take questions now. Thank you again for your time and for being patient. Thank you. Mm. No questions? Yeah. I know some, someone that had a question, he left. So I told him to send this question. Oh. So that I will definitely forward to you because he had to leave. So he will send it and then we'll ask. Okay. You. Yeah. Okay, okay. So if, if there are no questions, it's one of two things. I did a very good job or I did a terrible job. So you let me know. Um, hello. Yeah. Hello. Okay. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Please go ahead. Yeah. Miss Tolu. Yes. Please can you read the question in case we might just benefit from it? Uh, oh, he hasn't sent it to me yet. He sent a oh. message that he had to leave. That's why I can't oh, share okay. that it. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. So he said he has a question, but he has to leave. I said, send me the question, but he hasn't responded. So we are going to have to close this session. So that's why I said that if it's something that um, Buki feels is important, in the second session, she can go ahead and just answer that question as well so that we can all learn from it. OK. OK. So anyway, yeah. so since we don't have any questions, I'm just going to say a very big thank you to you, Buki. This has actually been a very informative session. And now I understand what you meant by it's not possible to finish in one session. And we'll definitely, definitely have a follow-up session. Um, the session will probably be hosted by our counterpart, our colleagues, um, the Canada version of aspiring business um, owners. But we'll all join. We'll all be there to participate and to learn more. Um, so thank you for all the takeaways, teaching us that, you know, detail matters, teaching us to study our competition. I mean, it goes in line with what Pastor Podju preaches. We should pay for our competition. competition. We should pay for people that are in the same line of business with us. And we can also learn from them, obviously. So I just want to say a very big thank you. It's been an honor and um, a privilege to have you. And to close, um, one of our guys is here, um, Professor Jegzi. Um, if you can give us a closing prayer. Let me check if he's still here. I think he is. I see. I see. Thank he's you so here. much, Buki, for the wonderful presentation. In now you need to understand the importance of having competitors, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and even if I didn't take anything out of this session, I took that out, right? Yeah, yeah. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Yeah, I know it's a whole lot of information, you know, 
But thank you for staying on. And hopefully next session, we will just um, drill down to the very important aspect of it. Thank you. Professor Degzi, take the floor. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Buki. I, I didn't join on time, but I met at the point where it was say, automatic. Go share yourself. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. And um, I, I believe that what we have learned today, um, it's a seed that has been sown. And assuredly, like the Bible would say, we're going to see the, the, the seed become tree and produce fruits. And we we'll begin to spread that fruit that will be seed into multiple, multiple domains and multiple areas. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Buki, for, for the uh, wonderful presentation. I got a lot from the part that I also... Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Father, we thank you because you are God. Thank you because right. you are good. Thank you for this time. Thank you for the blessings that you have released into our lives. Thank you for the vessel that you used to deposit this wisdom into us. Thank you because we are confident that this will be far reaching and it will help us to create that effect, the wealth that you have Amen. given us the power to generate the yeah. ideas that you have given us to solve a global problem yeah. the ideas you have given us to change the face of the earth thank you. we thank you because the wisdom that we have learned from this session tonight we go a long yeah. way in helping us to bring this into fruition in the name of jesus amen but i will thank you for all the various community groups and all the various programs that are lined up we pray as we move on in this semester, your wisdom will continue to be with us. Your grace will be sufficient and sustain us. Mm -hmm. And you will give us the strength and the ability to carry on in the name of Jesus. Thank you for the leadership and all the members for the grace and the ability that you have granted unto them. We give you all the praise. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank, Thank you so you much, Prof. Sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, Buki. No, Thank you, everyone, for attending. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. Have a great Thanks evening everyone. and a blessed, a blessed new week that is coming up. Right. Okay, good night, everyone. So, please, um, if you could help me, the host, please, if you could capture some of, I know there are some questions here that I have not been able to go over. Um, please, if you could kindly capture them, that would be good. And if you could share with um, me afterwards. I don't have any questions here, but we look. Um, okay, thank you. But I'll just say okay. this before we leave. If anyone has a question, please share it in your groups. Um, my name is Tolu Banjo, so I'll get it across to me, and I will forward it to Buki. And Buki's name is Buki Adekoye as well. We can send her a message as well directly, but so that all of us can benefit from whatever the response is to the question. So please, because the session is over, does not mean you cannot ask questions. Feel free to ask the questions. Okay, and same thing with Canada group too. Yeah. You can post it on the group as well. We'll get it across to her. Yes. Yeah. Also, when are we um, likely to get the recording so we can share with the members of the group? I'm going to um well, hopefully soon before by tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, I'm Thank going you. to have it. You know, Zoom will convert when it finishes and everything. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, but you guys will get it for sure. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Have a pleasant evening. Thank you. Thank you all right, thank you all very much. Good night, everybody. It was a great pleasure. All right, have a thank good night. Thank you, Sophie. Bye.